Hey, Way family, thank you for tuning in. God has an amazing word for you, so go ahead and check out this message. And after, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you. God bless. You know, uh, I just want to give you a little heads up that I know you might have come to church today wanting a good sermon, but you walked into the wrong place because today we're getting a life change. We're getting a transformation. And here, here's the issue with this. It, I got to tell you something that's really never happened to me is, uh, and I said this at the conference, Pastor Robert had talked last night about this prayer that went on in the city. You got to say that right before I get up next time on the 11th. And, and there was 24 hours of prayer, right, Pastor, that was done from, what was it, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. And that was on Friday. It was on Friday. And there was a guy from Africa. And a bunch of pastors all over this whole area. And what was the word they said? They said, God's reversing the curse completely over San Bernardino. And this was the beginning of the weekend when it began to happen. Right? So anyway, he's saying this story. And I'm sitting there saying, man, I'm preaching tomorrow. And, you know, God's not like, doesn't do things on accident. Right? Like, do you, have you guys figured that out by now? Like, oh, okay. I thought that was like messed up, but now it makes sense. Like, you know, like how many times have we done that? Like, Lord, I don't know what's going on here. And then later on, you're like, oh, I'm glad that uh, they weren't the person I thought I was supposed to marry. You know what I'm saying? Like you thought for sure, like that was the one from God. And then later on, you're like, thank you, Jesus, for not answering that prayer. I mean, right. I mean, we could just say so many different examples of like thanking God for the closed doors. How many of y'all have learned you got to thank God for the prayers he did not answer? Because if God would have just said yes to every prayer, oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. So I know things aren't by accident, right? So I'm sitting here, and, and for me, when I, when I minister, I, just, I really go to Jesus because I care uh, really about the people. I want my heart to feel what God feels for the people, right? So you're seeking God for a word. I don't ever really preach the same word anywhere, it seems like, because I believe that even though there might be a general message, there's a different recipe for every house, okay? So I, I, you are not just everybody, so you are individuals who God wants to say something to. If there was another group of a couple hundred people today, he would want to say something to them. Do you get what I'm saying? So usually it's the week of, or sometimes, many times, not until I walk up that God actually shares with me what he wants to say. And that's kind of annoying sometimes, but I'm really willing to say, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say. But for one of the first times ever, this was months ago when we knew we were going to come and minister to the marriage conference and they told me I was preaching Sunday. God told me like that, exactly what I was supposed to say. And it took me, I mean, my fingers could not type fast enough exactly the words God was downloading because he knows exactly what he's doing. And he came for me to tell you this. He told me to tell you, this is a prophetic Sunday where an impartation is going to happen to the entire church. Okay? Now, this is also something that's unusual that I really feel God told me to do. The message that he told me to preach is going to take two services. So part one is this service. Part two is the next service. Now, I understand if you have things going on. I just want to encourage you, though. Next service, there's going to be massive deliverance throughout this entire place. We are going to open up the altars next service, and we are not going to close them because we're going right into the one, and the worship team will be up here the entire time. We are going to take the time to pray. We're going to take the time to work with you, and I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is going to be released in this place, but I got to be able to get there. So this service, you guys came. You're wise that you came because I'm not going to be able to say any of this that I'm going to tell you in the next service, and this is all the beef is in this service, so I'm glad you guys are here. This is what it's all about today. I want you all to repeat this. Say, stir up the gift. Up the gift. Say it again. Stir up, stir up the gift. Who do you think stirs the gift? Is it God or is it you? No. It's you. God does not stir the gift for you. You have to stir the gift up in yourself. God told me this, Pastor. He said, your team, the leadership team, and many people who are not on it yet, who are about to be on it, especially after this Sunday, he says that San Bernardino needs more. And let me tell you what God does. If he can't find enough people who are willing to get out of their own way and allow God to move through them, 
what he does, and it's not because he doesn't love people, is he passes those people up and he gives what they should have had to the ones who are willing to do it and pay the price. The Bible says that the Israelites were in slavery for over 400 years. It says Moses came, and when they were delivered, it says the day they were delivered, they left with over 400 years of back pay. In other words, everything that their great, great, great grandfather, great grandmother was supposed to have, everything their grandfather was supposed to have, everything their dad and mom were supposed to have but weren't able to do because they were in bondage, everything they were gone, they got it all in one day. Let me tell you something. God never wastes the anointing and the gift. If you don't want it, he simply lets you be passed by and he gives it to your son or your daughter or your brother or your sister. And I'm telling you this, that if you are willing, and it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, that's not the qualification you need. It doesn't mean that you have to have great voice, that's not the qualification you need. It doesn't mean you have to memorize the whole Bible. Matter of fact, that's not the qualification you need. You know what the qualification is you need? A willing heart. Jesus, can you use this? Jesus, can you use my messed up life? Jesus, can you do something with this? That's all he's looking for. And I'm telling you, this service and next service, he's about to pass out gifts that people have passed up in your generational tree. Listen to me. There are people in your generational tree. Your father and mother didn't do what they were supposed to, maybe. Your grandparents, they were serving the devil. Your uncles and aunts were serving the devil. But in this service, God said, I've been holding out all the, because I don't waste them. And whoever is willing and has a heart and dedicates today, he says, I'm going to give it all to him in one service. He's going to impart to you. So you're about to get some power today. And what's going to happen to you is you're going to be lit on fire. The Bible says there's a couple ways to stir up the gift. We have to stir it up ourselves or you get it stirred up through the laying on of hands. Paul laid his hands on Timothy and he says, I'm going to stir up the gift in you. So we're going to lay hands on you. In the 11 o'clock service, every single one of you will be able to get hands laid on you and you are going to get something's going to happen. I'm just telling you that all the pastor, all the teams, their hands are going to get lit on fire and they're not even going to know what to do with it except give it away. Okay, so I'm not trying to hype up anything that's not going to be there. I just have faith and I know what God's going to do. I've seen it happen. Put that first screen up on the board, the first scripture. Thank you. Second Timothy one, six through seven. Now I'm going to start walking you through what we're going to do. Some sermons you preach. Preaching sounds like this. You must. And then some sermons you teach. Teaching sounds like this. You really should. Teachers say you really should. Preachers say you must. You must be saved. Today is the day of salvation, right? But I have a message I'm going to teach you. God, because God is coming in the spirit, y'all, of this. If you want it, you really should want this because I want you to have it so bad. That's, that's the heart of God for you today. He's not coming condemning. He's not coming in a way that's trying to put you down. He's not trying to make you feel guilty. That's not why you come to church. He's a loving father. He has his hands open. But what he's saying today is I'm willing to give you something if you'll meet with me, if you want this, okay? So 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us what? The spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. Okay, now we're, I'm just going to start doing this. Stay with me. There's going to be many scriptures today. They'll all be on the board. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That is the actual word is the word timid. That word timid comes from the root word timidity, which comes from the word intimidation. Okay. We'll talk about that in a little while. But he says, I got to remind you, Timothy, you got a gift in your life, but you're not stirring it up. Now, at this time, Timothy was over many churches that Paul had already planted. Paul had left it under his care. And Paul boasts about Timothy more than any other person you'll ever hear about in the New Testament. He actually says, and I might have the scripture a little bit later, but I'll just say it right now. He says of Timothy, and how many of y'all would like this said about you? Paul writes about Timothy in the message translation. It says, Timothy is the real deal. 
He's a Christian beyond reproach. He said he has purity beyond reproach. He's a man of God. He is trustworthy. He is my favorite disciple. Paul says this about him, that I have never had a son in the spirit like Timothy. Okay? But still, he's sitting here reminding him, you're not using the gift. Whoa. So wait a second. There's something that happens in the church where we seem to believe, and I'll tell you the myth at the end of this, but I'm going to say it now, that just if I'm pure, just if I'm holy, just if I get in the word or if I'm doing things right, then automatically the gift gets switched on by itself. That's a myth. It's not scriptural. Just because you're pure doesn't mean the gifts are all just going to happen in your life. You got to stir them up. Now, in the next service, I'm going to show you two things. One, how to stir up the gift. And two, the only thing that will make your gift go dormant and die. So, he says, remember, stir up the gift. 2 Timothy 1 in the New Living Translation says it like this. This is why I remind you to fan into flame. Oh, I like that. Fan the flame. In other words, Jesus said he gave gifts to all men and women. Every single one of you have a gift. It is a special gift. It is something that is powerful. You might look at yourself and say, there's no way I have a gift. I mean, I'm very normal. I'm less than normal. I'm pretty boring. I mean, maybe that's what you say about yourself, but God doesn't say that about you. He doesn't look at you and think you're boring. He doesn't look at you and think you're useless. He actually looks at you and said, I gave you a gift, but you got to fan it into flame. I gave you a spark, and now you got to blow on it. Are you seeing this? He says, fan into flame the spiritual gift God has given you when I laid my hands on you. See, there it is right there. Gifts can be imparted through the laying on of hands, and gifts can also be stirred up through the laying on of hands. That's what we're going to do in the next service. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. There it is again, timidity. But of what? Power, love, and of self-discipline. Now, most people think that is a sound mind. Some translations say a sound mind. The original Greek actually is self-discipline. Real quick, why is that so important that in order to be able to get your gift and to handle power and to handle love, you need self-discipline? Because nothing in your life comes through. It doesn't matter how much you want it. doesn't matter how much you have desire for it. doesn't matter how much you believe for it. If you do not have the self-discipline in order to make the hard choices to crucify your flesh on a daily basis and go through pain and go through suffering, which is the only way you get anything worth anything in this life. Let me tell you something. If you constantly want the easy way, you will never do anything of significance. If you constantly want no pain, if you want no inconvenience, if you want no change, then you are not going to be worth anything in the Christian walk. You're going to be a good person. You're going to come to church. You're going to, hey, God loves you. You're still going to go to heaven. Don't get me wrong. But you will not accomplish the things that God wants for you because the path to the gifts and the life that you have been praying for is through pain and suffering, not suffering in bad ways. I'm talking suffering that you're flesh suffers. I'm talking your flesh is going to hate it. Your flesh hates it when you got to sit down and pray, when you'd rather watch that show again. Your flesh hates it when you got to get up early in the morning, when you already haven't gotten that much sleep, and you're like, you know what, I got work and everything, but you got to get up and work out. Your flesh hates that. Your flesh hates it when you got to get up and say, you know what, Lord, I got to get in the word right now. Your flesh sometimes hates it, but your spirit needs to feed. Your spirit man needs some substance, and if you starve it, then you have nothing to fight with. Because let me tell you, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. The battle against you is a spiritual one. You can't take a knife and stab a demon. You can't take your sword, you can't take your fist and punch out a devil. It's spiritual. So you need a spiritual weapon to take care of a spiritual force. The spiritual sword is the word of God. If you're not full of the word of God, let me ask you this question. If you had right now to depend in your spirit, which the Bible calls the inner man, it's an actual person, the inner man, and your spirit, if you had to say, man, that spirit, I have to depend on that spirit to get me through a fight. In the condition your present spirit man would be in right now, would that spirit man be able to put up a fight? Or is he crippled? Does he only have one leg? Does he have any meat on him? Does he have one eye and he's got a little patch here? (laughs) 
can he even hear? Is he able to get up from his bed? Have you so emaciated him and he has no nourishment that he is worth nothing in the spirit right now? Because he has food and you got to give him some food. Never forget this. Whatever you starve will die. Whatever you feed will grow, good and bad. He says, you got to stir up this gift. Now, this is so powerful because when you think of gift, everybody usually thinks, well, the nine gifts of the Spirit, right? So we're thinking the gift of discernment. We're thinking the gift of, uh, of uh, wisdom. We're thinking the word of knowledge. We're thinking healing. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Listen to what gift actually means. That word gift is the word charisma. Write that down. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A. The word is charisma. <laughs> there it is. It's not charisma like if you ever knew about Charisma Magazine. They didn't actually originate that name, so it came from here. Okay. So the gift is charisma. Charisma means this, grace. Okay. So a gift is a portion of grace. Keep listening. Grace is this. This is what grace is. The divine influence on the heart reflected in the life. This is my definition that after all these years we get from all the concordances and everything else. It is God's empowering presence giving you the ability to go beyond the limits of the natural or human ability. So grace is not just a cover up of your sin. Grace is, it isn't just, you know, man, thank God for his grace because I messed up again. Oh, thank God for his grace. Does grace cover? Of course it covers. But that is not all that grace does. Grace is the empowerment. It is literally a portion of God himself, his own supernatural ability, a portion of his own entity that he takes and he puts inside of an individual because that portion of himself goes beyond the limits of human limits. It goes beyond the abilities of human abilities. That's why when you look at a certain person and they're really great, maybe they're a singer, and they come up, one person can sing and you're like, oh, wow, what a great heart. This person sings and you're like, they're gifted. Right? So it's a difference. There is something unusual about this person's voice. Not just talented, but it's like touched. Right? And then the person next to them, they have a great heart and you're still blessed by them, but you just know the difference. It's like saying, let's go play football, and you have a professional football player, a running back, who runs, and when he runs, there's something different. He's trained, he's disciplined himself, but there's almost a giftedness. He's so light on his feet, he can literally stop on a dime and come back and then move it. It's like he was born to run. And then there's other people who love football, but they're just not gifted like that. Right? Now, here's the thing. A gift is a portion of grace. That means that you can actually, the Bible talks about increasing the grace. So the grace can be increased. Meaning that whatever level that you might feel you have of giftedness, God can pour in more. Which means, and remember, gift is not you being just talented. It's you being more like God because you're getting more of God in an ability in a certain area of your life where God is putting a portion of himself into you, a divine influence on the heart reflected in the life. God's empowering presence. Let me, let me prove to you that grace is an empowerment. 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace, this is Peter talking, be multiplied to you. In the knowledge of God our Lord Jesus. So wait a second. If grace was just a cover-up, then how can it be multiplied? Grace isn't just something that covers you. We don't understand grace in the, in the church, most churches. It can be multiplied. It's something that grows because it's not just a covering. It's an empowerment. It's a portion of God himself. Let me give you another scripture. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace. And knowledge of our Lord Jesus, the Savior. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So you can multiply in grace. You can grow in grace. It can be grown. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. 
that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have in abundance for every good work. Listen to that word, in abundance. So you don't just get what you need. That's not God's best for you. If you're still at the place right now that you believe that, you know, God, as long as I have all my needs met, I'm happy. You're not using your faith. Because God does not just want you to be in a place where you just have all your needs met. You know why? Because that's a selfish thing to just have all your needs met. You need enough to give to someone else. You need enough to be able to pour on a widow that doesn't have a home. You need enough to be able to pour on some children who don't have anywhere to go. You need enough in your life to be able to pour on a single mom who's so depressed, but God gave you so much joy, you got to give it over to somebody. You need to be in the level of abundance because it's not about you. You see, when we talk about people having a lot of money or they're having abundance or we start talking prosperity, people get upset. Because they think it's all selfish and about them. Let me tell you something. I know nobody has ever told you this before, but I I just want this to sink in. You are a selfish person if you do not want to be rich. You're a selfish person if you don't want to be rich. How can you say that, Gavin? Because we have 150 orphans right now in Guatemala that you know what it takes to build them a home? Money. You know what it takes to get them some food? Money. You know what it takes to build a widow who has a seven by seven foot hut made out of corn stock and has eight children living inside of her home with her by herself on the side of a mountain with no heat, no electricity, money. So you got to get over this thing about money and realize you're not like all these other people who are going to use it for whatever. You're not trying to get rich for your own self. Just know you're different. Your heart's going to be right. And you need a lot of money in order to do a lot of things for the kingdom of God. It's as simple as that. Don't take it any deeper than that. Don't try to go, oh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's right. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of evil. The love of money. It means the money owns your heart. You don't own it. That's very different. That changed me when God said, you're selfish if you don't want to be rich. I said, wow. I need to get some resources Because God is looking for trustworthy hands to put it in that he can trust to put it somewhere he wants it to. And listen, y'all, here's the thing with God. He loves these orphans, these widows, these churches, these homeless people so much. If a Christian won't do it, he does not care. He'll give it to the unsaved. He'll give it to the people who don't have anything to do with it. He'll make them richer because they're going to do it. I can't tell you how many people who are not churchgoers support orphans. They give millions of dollars from their businesses. They give hundreds of thousands. They don't even go to church. They don't know anything about God. But they just know it's a right thing to do. But Christians are the ones who struggle with giving to the heart of God. They don't even think about it. They're like, oh, that sounds awesome. I'd like to be a part of that. That sounds like a good thing to do. For us, we know it's deeper than just a good thing to do. It's the heart of God. But for them, it's just a good thing to do. And look what they do. They put their money where their mouth is. It's crazy. Ephesians 4, 7. This is spiritual gifts. But to each one of us, grace was given. Oh, this is so good. According to the measure of Christ's gift. So there is a measure of grace that each one of you, it says each one of us. That means every person in this room. You were given a measure of grace, which means you were given a gift. You are given a measure of God's ability that will help you go beyond your own ability. Let me just give you a little insight here. It's God's ability that makes you stop temptation that you can't stop on your own. It's God's ability that makes you be able to change a thought process you've had for your entire life. It's God's ability that gets you off drugs when you could never quit on yourself. Let me tell you, because some drugs are hard to quit. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Alcohol is not easy to quit. I'm telling alcoholics, you cannot just do it on your own. But there's a level of God's ability that comes in, and he gives you an ability beyond your own natural ability to do it. So how many of y'all want more of God's grace? Okay, you want more ability. Okay. This ability, and this is so good. Romans 5, 17. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know if I'll be able to get off of this point right here. And y'all are going to be excited about what I'm about to say. 
This ability, when you receive it, you open up your life to it. It takes an obedient heart, a willing heart, not a perfect person, but just a heart that says, okay, God, I'm ready. You will begin to not only do better in life. Read Romans 5, 17. Put it up on the screen. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, there it is again, abundant provisions of this ability, and of the gift of righteousness reign in life. He didn't say reign in heaven. Reign in this life. Through who? Through one man, Jesus Christ. Oh, man, man, man. So what I'm trying to tell you today is you can reign over circumstances. You don't just have to get through circumstances. Now, whoever has the faith to believe and attach with me today, I pray you hear this. And if you don't have the faith right now and you're like, oh, God, I don't know if I can, I, I just, I can't get there right now. I want you right now to just, there's a prayer that's in the Bible. It's so powerful. The man who had Jesus came and all the disciples couldn't cast out the devil out of the sun. And the man came and Jesus came up and he said, Lord, if you are able. And he says, if I'm able to heal yourself. What are you talking about if I'm able? And he goes, Lord, help my unbelief. I just want, if you are feeling that right now, you don't have to do it out loud. I just need you to pause in just a second and say at this moment so that you can receive what we're going to do this morning. You got to say, Lord, help my unbelief. You can say it in your heart. If you're having trouble right now, there's nothing shameful about it. I've had to do this. Just take a moment. God, help my unbelief. Maybe you've been crushed. Maybe you've tried to hope for things before and you've been let down. Maybe, maybe I don't know the situation you've been in, but God wants to give you something today, but you got to have the faith to receive it. Those will reign in life. Ephesians 1, 18 through 19. Oh, this is good. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will, listen to this, know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, every one of you too, and his glorious riches in the glorious inheritance of the saints. You are God's people. You have riches. You have an inheritance that has been set for you. It is found in the gift he's put in you. Some of y'all haven't stirred it up yet, but this morning, if you'll agree with me in faith, God is going to ignite your gift. He's going to ignite this inheritance, this passion that's in you, so that you will begin to know what is the immeasurable. Oh, man. It's not, you can't measure this, y'all. What God wants to do through you, nobody can put a stamp on and say, that's all you are. How many of y'all have ever been put in a box before? How many of y'all said, man, this is all you'll ever do? This is all you're accomplished. You see, Jesus can't do that. He doesn't do that to you. What he gives you is so immeasurable, it doesn't matter if you looked one way five years ago. The second Jesus touches you, when he touches you, he leaves his fingerprint. Listen, when God leaves his fingerprint, he leaves something that's eternal. Which means eternity cannot be measured because it's the essence of God himself. That's why the angels have to cry, holy, 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 holy. Because even though they circle him every single day, all day long, they still see another facet they never saw before. And so in other words, you keep discovering things you never discovered before. I told this to some of the married couples. That's why the chase never ends when you're married. Because you're married to an eternal soul. That means there's always still something to discover in your married partner. You just got to be willing to look for it. Anyway, so you're coming and there is eternity. So God touches you and then therefore everybody who wants to put you in a box, the boxes explode. I don't care. And here's the thing, y'all. Maybe nobody else has put you in a box, but you have put a box on yourself. I will always be a construction worker to the day I die. I, this is real. I'm all, I mean, it's what I've done my whole life. I mean, I can't expect anything else. I don't have any tenure at another job. And, you know, I, I, I just really never done. I don't have an education for anything else. I don't have any degrees. You know how much degrees matter to God? You know why? Because people who are gifted, a person has to work for a degree for five, ten years. There's nothing wrong with degrees. Don't get me wrong. If you want education, you need to go for it. But what I'm saying is there can be a person who worked for it for ten years and then somebody right next to them who showed up the first day who's gifted. And they get the promotion over the person who worked for it for ten years. 
Y'all have all seen this happen. There's people like, man, I've been here longer than them. I've been here. What? How did they get on stage? What? They had a gift, y'all. I get it that you think your voice is the greatest voice in the world, but this person has a gift. It doesn't mean you're never going to sing. Don't get offended. God can increase the measure of the gift. Amen? Maybe take some voice lessons as well, but praise God. <clears throat> okay. Anyway. What does this give us the ability to reign over? I only got a couple minutes left. Oh, this is going to be good. Can I have my piano player back out here? My brother, come on back. If you hear me back there, oh, come on. <laughs> Number one thing, you reign over. I want you to say this out word. I rule over sin. Woo, Romans 6, 14. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. I don't care if you failed seven times, ten times. I don't care if you stumbled a hundred times. I don't care if you stumbled two hundred times. I don't care if you say the Bible says that a righteous man will fall down six times, but the Lord will lift him up again. Now, I don't care. Now, listen, every single one of you have a seventh time. That means it's the last time you're going to fall. Now, that might be the 500th time, but it's your seventh time. And I'm telling you today, some of y'all, it's the last time time you'll ever fall who has faith to believe what i'm saying today you got to drink it in you got to get in faith yeah brother let's have some church in here today i came to deliver an impartation for whoever wants it let me tell you what happens what what maybe you just want to ask let me just give a little note why do people shout in church why do people got to stand up and wave their hands and do all that? It doesn't prove nothing. I get you. Here's the issue. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. <clears throat> Jesus, Mary, is pregnant with Jesus. In Elizabeth's third trimester, which was Mary's first trimester, they cross paths. And it says, as they cross paths, this is so powerful if you get this, that Elizabeth comes into the presence of Mary. But what was really was happening was John the Baptist was coming into the presence of Jesus. Now watch what happened. The first person to recognize the Messiah was not Simon in the temple. That's who people think it was. The first person to recognize Jesus was the Messiah was an unborn child. An unborn child in the womb. Because when he came into the presence of Jesus, this is going somewhere, just listen. He jumped. Why did he jump? Because everything about John the Baptist's life, everything about John the Baptist's life was connected to pave the way for that baby. His purpose was connected to that promise in that womb. And when he got close to the purpose, he received what he needed in order to fulfill and pave the way for Jesus. Do you know what he received? The Holy Ghost. The Bible says on the moment that Elizabeth's baby jumped within her, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Who? Why? It wasn't because of Elizabeth, y'all. It's because John the Baptist, even before he was born, needed the Holy Ghost to do the call and pave the way for that other baby. Now, why is this important to you? People who understand this shout. Why? Because there's something about a shout. You know what a shout does? You know what standing does? You know what worshiping does? It's not for anybody else. You know why you do it? Because something has touched you. And when your baby jumps, get this, when your baby jumps, the only reason it jumped is because there's something in your destiny you still haven't touched and the purpose is trying to reach you. And so if you shout, you connect. If you show your faith, you connect. If you want it, you connect. Woo! Woo! It's trying to connect to you. But he needs a little bit of faith to get the last 10%. So see, it's not about anybody else. We could have church all by ourselves because you're going to receive something when you connect in faith. And sometimes a little shout, sometimes raising the hand, sometimes a yes, Jesus is all you needed to connect. I got to keep moving. 
We only have a couple. Titus 2, 11 through 12. Oh, this is good. Number two, he first gives you the power to rule over sin. What else are you going to reign over with this grace? You get to reign over. Here we go. Here's the scripture. Put up Titus 2, 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say, here we go, to say no. <laughs> I love that. To ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. That's what the grace of God does. It gives us power over all of that. But here's number two, Luke 10, 19. It gives you power. Say this. I have power to reign over the devil himself. Woo! Luke 10, 19. I give you all authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power. How much power? How much power? Did you just say all? Well, then what are you doing being afraid of the dark in your house? What are you doing being afraid of going to those old neighborhoods? What are you doing being afraid to go back to those places? You think the devil's bigger than God? He said all power. Do you realize that when you got saved, God took ownership of you? Do you realize that God takes it personal when something comes into your circle? You got a daddy who's a pretty big guy. I give you authority over every serpent. And listen to this, that nothing by any means will hurt you. Well, Gavin, I've seen a lot of Christians get hurt, and a lot of Christians get hurt, and gang violence, and this and that. Well, you know why? They didn't step into the circle. They didn't claim the circle. They didn't get into the blood of Jesus. Now, listen, any of you can step out of the circle at any time. All you got to do is be continuously disobedient, because God has no obligation to protect somebody who will not obey what he says. So we're just going to move on from that. Praise God. Number three. Say this, I have power to reign over sickness and disease. I, come on, over sickness and disease. First Peter 2, 24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And listen, by his wounds you, you will be healed. I said you will be healed. R means in the present moment, whenever you read this scripture, that's the moment it could happen. You know why he said R? Because he says whenever they finally get around and they come to this scripture, whatever moment it is in their life, whatever time it is, at that moment, there are. At that moment, it's that present moment. And if you have the faith, you do not have to live in sickness for the rest of your life. I'm telling you, well, Gavin, it's hard. Listen, you got to pray till something happens, y'all. Some people want to pray once. Well, I prayed and it didn't work. Listen, <laughs> listen, you got to trust that God's so good. He knows things you don't. But you don't change the promise just because of your experience. You can't change the Bible. I, I, I understand that you've tried and it hasn't worked, but it's still in the text. You can't just change and rewrite the Bible based on your experience. The Bible has to change your experience. And you know what you do? I've done this. There's been multiple times I've prayed for healing for myself, and nothing's happened. And then all of a sudden, I'm sleeping, and one day I wake up, and it happened. I wasn't spiritual at all. All of a sudden, it happened. But you know what I know? I know better now. Why? It was because of all those times I believed in faith and all those people laid hands on me and all those times we agreed in faith that it's God's business the day it happened. But let me tell you something. I did my part and all of a sudden because of all that, God knew that on this day it was the time it was supposed to happen. That's called trusting God. But your job is to believe. Number four, I got to continue. We only got two more. This is it. I have power, say it, to reign over poverty and lack. No, you got to say this again because some of y'all have been dirt poor before. Over poverty and lack. How many of y'all have not known if you would be able to get groceries that week? I want you to stand on your feet right now. Stand. If you said, I've been poor to a place. Look at all these people. You didn't even know if you'd have food on the table right there. And look at all of you in church right now. Has God been faithful to you? God has been faithful. 
All right, you can sit down. I, we, man, we could get on fire with just that. But let me tell you something. All lack in poverty is not supposed to be a part of you. I don't have time to explain it right now. I wish I could go into it. But y'all, the theme that Jesus was dirt poor is a lie. I'm going to continue. Deuteronomy 15, 4. There should be no poor among you. Wait a minute. This is God talking to the Israelites, his people. And he says, as long as I have you when I have you and you're under my care, there's no poor among you. I'll explain this in just a second. For the Lord your God will greatly bless you in the land he has given you as a special possession. Now, this is God's mouth, not mine. There should be no poor among you. Why is God take it personal if people are poor? Because before anything else, God is a king. Listen, he's a king. He doesn't run a democracy. He runs a kingdom. And one of the first things you'll know about a kingdom is the king of the kingdom. How the citizens of the kingdom look reflects upon the king. If you are poor, if you're broke, the citizens get to come to the kingdom and say, look, this is what you have as a citizen. God takes it personal. If you are broke, if you cannot meet your needs, if you, cannot ha you can't get medical insurance, he takes all of these things personal and he wants to do something in your life. But let me tell you this. You know what the only thing that stops him is? If you believe you're supposed to be poor. If you believe it's what you deserve. If you believe, you know what? I I'm a Christian. You know, this is just part of my persecution. <laughs> Good God. Number five, and this is the last one, and that's Psalm 23, verse 1. Let me read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. Let's say this again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack. What does it say? I lack? I mean, I don't know what else that means besides nothing. The last one, number five. Here we go, and then we're going to pray. Go ahead, brother. Start playing with me. I have power. Come on. I have power to rule over. The areas of society I've been called to. If you are a teacher in this place, I need you to stand up right now. If you are a teacher. If you teach any kind of class, or you teach any kind of classroom, I don't care if it's children's church, I don't care if it's actually at schools. I want us to all give a hand for our teachers right now. These people are underpaid and underappreciated many times. Right there, if you are a teacher. Now I need you teachers to lift your hand. Because you are pouring in on a daily basis into people's lives. I don't care if you're teaching history, if it's English, if it's math. You have an actual contact with children, with young people, whatever age, maybe it's college, that you are on a continual path. Have this. Now listen. God wants to make you the kind of teacher that is not like every other teacher. Because a gifted teacher... Well, you might be like, well, maybe that's not one of the gifts I had when I was born. Let me tell you a good secret. Even if you don't have the gift yet, if you're in that arena and you want to infect that arena for Jesus, he'll give you a gift you weren't even born with. Just because you weren't born with it doesn't mean faith can't get it. Lift your hands. I'm going to pray the grace of God into every one of you teachers. I'm going to pray, listen, the ability of God. The ability of God. You're going to write plans. They're going to be so organized. You're going to come up with ideas in order to help teach students that they will learn in ways that they couldn't have learned before. You're going to touch their minds and their hearts when they don't understand and they can't pick up the lessons from other people and they feel dumb and they feel stupid. You're going to be the way to be able to get it to them. I thank you in the name of Jesus that the grace, there it goes, all into this left section right here. I impart the grace to you right now. Meet with my faith right here. I impart the grace. I impart the grace. It can be increased. I give it to you increased measure. Increased measure all the grace right now all on this right side in Jesus name all over this building every teacher now I want you to lay hands on your heart right now who's standing and I just want you to say this I receive the empowerment to go beyond my own ability from this day forth I expect great ideas patience patience great patience that I will see God move in my sphere of influence you can take a seat. If you work in the construction business, stand up. Stand up. If you work in the construction business, I want you to stand up. If you are a painter in any kind of way, if you are a general contractor, if you work with machinery, stand up. Do you know how many unsaved people are around you all day? 
I guarantee you the majority of all your teams don't love Jesus. I worked as a contractor for a few years. Woo, it's vile, man. Some vile talking, vile language. It's like one step under the military. Because the military is the most vile I've ever heard in my life. Put your hands up. Do you want to be a soul winner? How many of you know people in your sphere right now that you would love to see touch with the Lord? Just wave your hand at me. I don't need to know their names, but you know their names. If you want that, close your eyes. Because Jesus needs to enlarge your heart of compassion. He can give you gift. He can give you grace to empower you to break for the people you work with. To love them. God, I pray for opportunities to speak. I pray for opportunities that will show up on job sites, on the way to job sites, in places that, Lord, they will be the best workers they have ever been in their jobs. They will get more accomplished. They will be great at their job, whether it's carpentry, electrician, whatever it might be, a plumber. I thank you in Jesus' name. They will be great at what they do. But, Lord, let it be an eternal thing now. We hand it over for the eternal right now. Every one of your jobs can be eternally pointed in Jesus' name. Go ahead and sit down. I don't have time to go through more prayers, but I want everybody to lift their hands. Just sit where you are. Seat where you are. Everybody lift your hands. Woo! Thank you, God. I feel the Holy Spirit in here today. He came with gifts. He came with gifts today, and he's wanting to pour them out. He came with portions of himself. He came with portions of grace. He came with portions of power. Man. Keep your hands lifted. Deuteronomy 28, 13. Listen as I say the word over you. If you listen to all these commands, Lord your God, I'm giving you today. And if you carefully obey them, then the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will always be on top. And you will never be on the bottom. If you receive that promise, I need you to stand right now. Because that's the baby jumping inside of you. You need to make a movement. You will be the head and not the tail. In your sphere of influence, whatever job you have, you will never be on the bottom again of the list. You will never be on the bottom of the pay list. You will never be on the bottom of the want list. You will always be on top. Because you reign over the circumstances in life because of the grace, the empowerment, the portion of God's ability that is available for you. Daniel, y'all, was ten times wiser than any other man, the Bible says. Ten times. And he was the only prophet, listen, who went through five different kings. The only prophet who actually went through five kings as their prophet. He, he discovered a lot of different kind of kingdoms and issues and ways that things work. But he stayed over ten times wiser than any. And there were hundreds of wise men among him. When nobody could interpret a dream, the gifted man could. When nobody could give wisdom, the gifted man could. When nobody could say what was needed to be said in the right circumstance to turn the kingdom right back toward God, the gifted man had the answer. The gifted man and woman has an answer when the world is scratching their heads. Man, we need this. Matthew eleven eleven. 11, I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, now listen, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even, watch this. Now, if Daniel was 10 times wiser than any man, Jesus comes up and he says, of all the men who have ever lived, no one was greater than John the Baptist. In other words, John the Baptist is greater than Daniel. But then he says in the next sentence, But even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than even he is. Whoa, 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 whoa. You see, Daniel had something available to him at the time. But Daniel didn't have the overflowing of the power of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist had something available at the time, and he got the Holy Ghost in order to help him with the call. But Jesus says, I'm about to bring a new thing. When I hit the cross and I raise from the grave, you're going to get a new testament. You're going to get a new covenant that is going to empower you that the least in this reign will even be greater than even John the Baptist, which was greater than Daniel. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. We pray that you were encouraged and empowered. Don't forget to check out some other messages we have on our YouTube channel and share, subscribe to thewayworldoutreach.org. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week.